Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan uh, good morning everyone to all our viewers out there, uh, to friends of uh, Faculty of Engineering, uh, friends in our uh, Facebook, uh, Facebook. So my name is Zainul Akmal Zakaria, uh, I'll be your MC and also moderator today for our 103rd uh, Distinguished Lecture Series session. So yeah, we come all this way, yeah, we are to, in our 103 sessions now. So today we are very proud and very grateful to introduce to you our next speaker, uh, Professor Hadianto from Universitas Diponegoro, Semarang, Indonesia. So uh, he'll be sharing some of his uh, experience in working with uh, algae and also how uh, the valorization of algae in the form of biomass to as a form of energy and uh, and other stuffs. So maybe just to share a bit about how. Uh, our first engagement with uh, Prof. Hadianto uh, is actually when uh, myself we and Prof. Pahadi, we, we, we are meeting in one conference in Taiwan. So we were uh, start to get to know each other. Then from there, we uh, uh, invited uh, each other to contribute in uh, book chapters, uh, then um, to review some of our publications. And also Pahadi also give given uh, myself opportunity to deliver some talk uh, one talk into his uh, in, in his one event in his university so hopefully uh, we are looking forward really looking forward to have more collaborations with uh, professor hadianto and undeep in general and also his uh, his vast network in indonesia yeah so uh, without uh, further ado I would like to invite our uh, distinguished dean uh, professor rafi to give to introduce our speaker today over to you bro Thank you, Zainul. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to 103rd UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Muhammad Rafiq, and I'm the Dean of Engineering, University of Technology, Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Professor Hadianto from Universitas Diponegoro, Indonesia. A bit about our distinguished speaker today. Hadianto is a full professor of Bioprocess Engineering, Chemical Engineering Department, Universitas Diponegoro. After finishing his PhD from Food and Bioprocess Engineering, Wageningen University, the Netherlands, in 2007, he had an opportunity to work as a scientist at NISO Food Research BV Netherlands from 2007 to 2009 and research associate at Process Intensification Group at TU Delft, Netherlands in 2009. Besides, he has also been invited as visiting research fellow at KU Leuven, Belgium in 2011, Kyoto University in 2012, and DTU Denmark 2014. He is also actively involved in Sustainable Energy and Environment, SEE Forum. From 2012, he was chairing Center of Biomass and Renewable Energy, C. Bioray, Universitas di Ponegoro, and in 2019, he was appointed as Vice Dean for Academic at School of Postgraduate Studies. He is also actively involved in editorial assignment as Editor-in-Chief of International Journal of Renewable Energy Development. So that is a brief biography of our distinguished speaker. Here now is Professor Hadianto from Universitas di Ponegoro, Indonesia, with a lecture on harnessing energy from algae biomass. Professor Hadianto, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rafiq, for inviting me to this uh, lecture. And also, Pak uh, Zainul, uh, to keep this opportunity. Let me share this uh, file. Okay, uh, my talk today is about harnessing energy from microalgae biomass. Uh, first of all, my name is Hadianto. It's already introduced by Prof. Rafik and also Pak Zainul. I'm from Sa Universitas di Ponegoro, uh, especially in Center of Biomass and Renewable Energy. Uh, we are working especially in developing uh, energy from a certain biomass, including micro microalgae. <coughs> uh, our uh, questions are uh, right now is what we are going to do after 50 years uh, from now because uh, in every country already face uh, with 
uh, energy crisis, including Indonesia. Indonesia starting 2006 already importing uh, fossil oil. And then uh, some country already searched out the alternative energy, including uh, biofuel and also nuclear, uh, geothermal, and other renewable energies. Uh, if we're talking about biofuel, we have uh, first generations, yeah, uh, about 1923. Uh, uh, yeah, in that time, uh, the first researcher uh, tried to use uh, raw oil uh, to fuel uh, the engine. And then uh, the source for the first generation is from the food crops. And, and then uh, second generations uh, start with the all sources that without compete to the food, uh, food uh, crops. Yeah. Uh, the second generation, we can see, uh, for instance, straw and then manure, yeah, and then all the lignocellular uh, sources can be uh, converted into biofuel. And then for the third generations that we are going to discuss today is uh, energy from uh, microalgae, yeah, from microorganisms. Uh, not only microalgae, but other microorganisms is also possible. And maybe coming to the fourth generation is. Uh, uh, we, if we can modify the micro, uh, microorganisms uh, to generate uh, energy, that uh, uh, will be the fourth or maybe the fifth uh, gener generations. <clears throat> We're talking about microalgae. If you see here, microalgae is uh, such kind of uh, photosynthetic microorganisms, and the size is very tiny. Uh, uh, one to 500 micrometers, yeah. For instance, the figures in the left side, this is a chlorella, the size is only 10 micrometers. And then we have also uh, D here, the figure of D, uh, this typical size, a uh, typical uh, form of the microalgae spirulina. The size is 500 micrometers. So the to extract this biomass is very easy, just filter it by using uh, normal filters can be possible but the problem for the tiny uh, microalgae for instance for uh, chlorella and then chlamydomonas that's not possible to use of normal filters uh, the nice thing for this microalgae is uh, the main compounds uh, consists of carbohydrates and then lipids and protein yeah all of the microorganisms has the three compounds. And then normally they are living in uh, fresh water or in saline waters. Uh, about the microalgae is already predicted by, already uh, discovered by uh, some researcher even in 1912. Uh, Mr. Giacomo Chiamisians from University of Bologna, uh, he said that on the arid lands, forest of glass tubes will extend. Inside of this will take place the photochemical processes mastered by human industry. Make them bear even more abundant from, uh, fruit than nature. And also uh, Mr. Prelimir, uh, he said that edible microscopic organisms in lakes, every lake will become a kettle of ready-made soup that only need to be heated. Contented people will lie about on the shore having dinner. So from this case, uh, from this uh, slide, we see that uh, they already predicted, but in the future there will be uh, industry that running by uh, photochemical processes and only use uh, classes and can be uh, can be developed on the arid arid lands. Yeah. Okay, we're talking about microalgae. Yeah, uh, the first principle we have to know what is the photosynthesis. Is the photosynthesis is just converting from carbon sources, from CO2 uh, into biomass. The biomass can be uh, the uh, the other formula rather than sugar here. So the important thing is that if you have carbon sources and then you have a medium, yeah. Uh, or water here and then uh, the other important is the light yeah because if the plant without the light they will never grow uh, also uh, microalgae yeah microalgae is also the same 
And in this case, if uh, you have uh, energy from the sun or also from the from the light in the laboratory uh, we have to consider about the photo inhibition and photo limitation because in certain uh, certain length of the the light uh, microalgae will have uh, inhibited and also will have a uh, grow yeah so we have to search more in certain uh, microorganisms uh, they will uh, grow in certain lengths of the uh, of the light, and then uh, the other in, important factor is nutritional. Yeah, uh, the important uh, nutrition for the microalgae is carbon sources. There are two or three uh, carbon sources. First is autotropic. Autotropic means that uh, carbon sources come from uh, uh, CO2 itself. Yeah. And then you have also uh, heterotropic. It means that carbon sources for microalgae can be supplied from the organic uh, compound. Yeah, for instance, uh, in this case, uh, acetic acid. Yeah, uh, you can use it. And also uh, for the third case, uh, you can mix between autotropic and heterotropics. And then uh, besides of uh, carbon sources, we have also nitrogen sources and other mineral and trace element and also vitamins. Yeah, the same as a human, they all uh, compound are also uh, needed by humans. And we have also external uh, factor that may affect to the growth of microorganisms. The first of all is pH. Yeah, pH of the some microorganisms are different. Uh, for instance, uh, microorganisms coral, uh, uh, spirulina they they prefer to live in pH higher than seven, but some of the microalgae also can live in below than seven. Yeah, so it really depend on the on the microorganism itself. And then salinity. Yeah, salinity. They can grow from the fresh water until high salinity, and also the temperature. The temperatures can be from uh, uh, low or uh, room temperature or uh, high temperature. And uh, processing parameter, we have also gas transfer here. Uh, it means that how we can transfer from uh, uh, carbon sources to the cells, uh, because when you cultivate the cell microorganisms uh, or microalgae, there will be transport of uh, oxygen yeah, coming from the bottom, and then it's carry uh, carbon sources, and then it's uh, made with uh, algae cell, then uh, algae cell will consume. <clears throat> so the important here is the transfer system between CO2 and uh, microalgae. We have to look at it. And then mixing, yeah, mixing is important part as, as well. Yeah, uh, if you increase the mixing rate, maybe you will have a high yield, and then the, the growth is better. And then the light requirement, yeah. If you if you don't have any sunlight, then you can use light uh, uh, in the laboratory as long as the length uh, wave is uh, the same. <coughs> okay. Uh, if you look at the algae history, yeah, actually it's already start in uh, about uh, 1965 for microalgae. Yeah, for microalgae, maybe it's already uh, earlier. Uh, uh, spirulina, yeah, in 1965, uh, it's already started cultiv uh, cultivated in Mexico, in Thailand, yeah, and then chlorella in 1975 by Japanese uh, industry and then Taiwan and then uh, we have also Denaliela in 1982 yeah and then Odontella is a uh, rather new as cultivated in United States yeah if we look at again uh, what's the composition as I said before that the the main compound of uh, microalgae is protein carbohydrate and lipid if we see here uh, the italic font is uh, microalgae. Yeah, uh, the protein content is ranging between forty-three to uh, maybe 70, uh, seventy-one. Yeah, it means that if you want to have a uh, food supplement for the high protein, you can use this Perulina Maxima. Yeah, they have a uh, sixty till seventy-one uh, percent protein. It's comparable than uh, milk, uh, only twenty-six percent. 
or maybe soybean only 67 percent and then we look at carbohydrate yeah carbohydrate for the microalgae is uh, also ranging from 12 to until uh, uh, 57 percent is uh, quite high as well and then for lipid yeah for lipid we have a certain microalgae that has a very high uh, lipid content yeah we know if uh, some biomass has a lipid uh, contents high then they can be converted into into energy carbohydrate as well they can be used for a uh, source for uh, energy for human and also for energy for uh, for engine for instance if you uh, ferment uh, this bio uh, biomass uh, then you will have a uh, bioethanol yeah <clears throat> so this uh, comparison between the microalgae and then uh, or food that already we uh, consume every day uh, the product that already uh, derived from the biomass uh, we can see from the tables here we, uh, they can be used for food and also for feed, yeah, for food because it contains high uh, protein con uh, protein content. Then they can be uh, used for uh, food supplement, yeah, and then also uh, for feed, yeah, for animals. Uh, they can be used as well for uh, food addition. And then so, some pigment uh, for blue color uh, for. Uh, food or for textile they can also extract from this uh, microalgae for instance this blue color here is a, a picture of phycocyanin yeah phycocyanin is the blue color pigment that derived from the spirulina yeah it can be extract until uh, when you extract a protein from uh, spirulina then uh, you extract again and then you will have this uh, nice blue color uh, we call it as uh, phycocyanin and then for uh, fuel, if you have a long chain hydrocarbon, yeah, and then you have also lipids, then can be converted into uh, biofuels. Yeah, there's some uh, available product in the market that already uh, can be yeah can be uh, buy by uh, some consumer. Yeah, for instance, this chlorella. Yeah, you can see in the apothec as well. And then so this for masking yeah for uh for women to uh cleanse uh, your skins and then for uh food additions <clears throat> okay uh if we look at the the whole processes for this uh microalgae first maybe you have to identify which sheet or which uh, source uh, can be extract for this uh, microorganisms it can be from the fresh water can be from the sea can be from uh, the lake yeah and then you extract uh, one cell or two cell and then you make isolate uh, isolation of the identification and the isolation and then you have to uh, culture it yeah you cultivate it in the in the photobioreactors and then to supply uh, the nutrient you have to give uh, some nutrient here as i said before it must be contain of nitrogen uh, phosphor and also uh, calcium and then uh, carbon dioxide uh, has to uh, supply uh, for uh, carbon sources yeah in order to make this photosynthesis uh, cured and also sunlight yeah sunlight is also required to uh, accelerate the photosynthesis processes and then after uh, maybe 14 days or uh, one week they can be uh, can be harvested uh, <coughs> depend on the product that you want to have uh, certain uh, separation or processing can be can be done you can have a extraction if you want to have a protein or you have to uh, have oil uh, from this biomass you can have a, a fermentation if you want to have a bioethanol yeah and you can have anaerobic conversions if you want to have hydrogen and then you can have catalytic conversion if you want to have a paraffin or olefins yeah so this type of uh, bioenergy that can be derived from this uh, typical tiny microorganisms uh, microalgae uh, how about the photobioreactor that we can use uh, 
the first, the, uh, there are two types of photobioreactor. First is photobioreactor step, the, the closed system. Yeah, uh, we can call it as closed because normally they just uh, just chew and then uh, the the system is just closed. Yeah, and then like this. Yeah, and then the second system is open pond, or we can call it as resuis. Yeah, this is open. Yeah, because it contact directly to the to the atmosphere. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> If we compare uh, two systems, uh, of course, uh, there are uh, some plus and minus for both system. The productivity for the photobioreactor or for closed uh, system is higher than open pond. Why? Because a uh, photobioreactor is controlled, yeah? It's under our control. Uh, you can adjust pH, you can adjust uh, light, yeah? Because normally it's under control in the laboratory or the uh, in the uh, greenhouse, yeah. That we can control, we can supply the nut nutrient, yeah. Uh, we can reduce the contaminant, yeah. Uh, if we compare to the uh, open system, yeah, open pond or raceway, uh, you see here that it's easily to have contaminant, yeah. Contamination it very easily happens. That's why uh, the productivity is uh, lower. Moreover, uh, if you look at the closed system, yeah, the closed system, water losses will be low, yeah, because there is no uh, direct uh, direct evaporation pro by the sunlight. But if you have uh, this open system, yeah, open pond, uh, the the sunlight is continually uh, imposed to to the to the system, yeah. And then uh, the water will be evaporated. Yeah, that's why the water losses will be will be high. And the disadvantage for photobioreactor is oxygen uh, build up. Yeah, because of photosynthetic. Uh, if you look at the photosynthetic reactions uh, from CO two uh, and then become biomass plus oxygen. Yeah. If you have a closed system, it means that the oxygen will be accumulated in the in the photobioreactor. Yeah, the oxygen build up will be will be high. That is uh, must be uh, you must be careful uh, to uh, to control it. And then for open pond, of course, the oxygen uh, accumulation will be uh, will be less. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about biomass concentration for the close bio photobioreactor is uh, high because it's under control, but for the open pond is uh, a bit less than uh, biomass uh, than photobioreactors. Yeah, <clears throat> but uh, for large production, for large productions, open pond is much more uh, preferable than a uh, photobioreactor. Is that? If you look at the economical uh, view, yeah. <clears throat> uh, we look at the open pond. Uh, there are uh, several type of open ponds. Yeah, in the uh, microbiology cultivations, you see here the normal uh, pond will be like this. Yeah, the rest way. Uh, the system is just uh, something uh, like here, and then there is a spirited. Uh, wall, yeah, the respirating walls, uh, in order to, uh, in order to have uh, circulation, uh, circulation of the microalgae because there is a pedal wheel here that circulate the medium or circulate the microalgae uh, around the uh, the photobioreactors, yeah, and then so this also uh, other typical of uh, open pond, yeah, the two U uh, U type of open pond, yeah, <coughs> and then uh, the circulation is uh, done by uh, very big uh, uh, wheel, yeah, and then uh, this is the common uh, open ponds. And then uh, we can have also a large open pond with different uh, flows like this. Yeah, it depends on your preference. Yeah, and the spreading walls. Yeah, spreading walls can be uh, wider or can be can be uh, narrow like this. Yeah, can be just uh, narrow. Uh, 
uh, from the design uh, of you, yeah, design of you, and the purpose for the wider uh, island here in the middle of the open post has a uh, purpose to reduce the death, uh, yeah, death volume uh, in the uh, in the liquid, yeah, in the microorganisms that. Uh, uh, in the open, open, open ponds. <clears throat> uh, to reduce uh, the uh, death volume, if we, we can, we cannot see here easily uh, whether there is a death volume or not, a death zone or not. But if you look at the CFD, yeah, we done some CFD computational free dynamic for, uh, to design this uh, open pond. You see here, in, this is a normal open pond from the left side normal open pond if you uh, make a computational flow dynamic of the flow of the circulation you see here that exactly after uh, circulation yeah exactly after circulation there is a dead uh, zone yeah uh, dead zone is not preferable because uh, the nutrient will accumulate in that area and makes uh, the nutrient will not homogenize, yeah, will be not uh, homogenize enough to be consumed by the microorganisms. That's why the dead zone here must be eliminated or must be, must be reduced. There are uh, several types of reducing uh, dead zones, yeah, first uh, by using a reflector like this, yeah, the, the same as what we have here. So actually this uh, reflector or deflector is the purpose for reducing the dead zone. That's what we have here. You see, if we have a reflector, yeah, the dead, the blue area or the the dead zone will be eliminated. Yeah. And then uh, the weather of uh, island and yeah, the weather of island. That's uh, we this one on top of left yeah uh, the purpose is also to reduce the dead zone you see here yeah so that we assume that the weather area of uh, island uh, will also eliminate this uh, dead dead zone <coughs> uh, the weather island or make it the island the shape exactly what the uh, dead zones uh, available in the open pond will be uh, also reduce this uh, this uh, dead zone yeah so for instance like this yeah you see here this uh, the purpose is to reduce uh, the dead zone in this in this area <clears throat> so that's the power of a computation of free dynamic uh, for photobioreactor, actually, uh, to cultivate microorganism, uh, this microalgae is very easy. You can use a uh, plastic, simple plastic, and then uh, supply by using uh, nutrient, also uh, CO2 maybe, and then supply to uh, to the plastic. Yeah, because the cultivation must be in uh, aerobic, then you have to supply some oxygen maybe inside the the. Uh, photobioreactor you can also uh, use uh, this one yeah so this is a uh, photobioreactor uh, horizontal I right don't and then also these verticals yes uh, there are a lot of variation of photobioreactor that uh, already developed right now uh, <clears throat> the problem of uh, microalgae uh, Cultivation is the harvesting, yeah, harvesting. Because if you uh, cultivate microalgae, actually you just get a uh, ten percent of a uh, biomass. The rest, ninety percent, is about the water. So we have to select which uh, harvesting method that uh, suit to the uh, to this process. Uh, the consideration is the first the size of the cell. The size of the cell is uh, I can I said before between uh, one to five hundred micrometers. That makes uh, the harvesting method will be uh, yeah will be consider uh, which one is the best. Yeah, uh, the first common method is flocculation. Flocculation this is normally for the uh, microalgae that has a very very small yeah very small uh, size. Yeah. So you add the uh, coagulant, yeah, coagulant, and then uh, each 
uh, microorganisms become significant proc and then you can easily uh, filter uh, the biomass. Uh, the advantage of using flocculation is time saving, of course, because you just add the flocculon and then you will have uh, directly the biomass. It's very, uh, very, uh, very fast. Yeah, but the uh, disadvantage is the high cost of flocculon, and it that uh, we have to uh, consider. And then uh, the second uh, technique is using filtration. Yeah, filtration. This normally for micro algae that has a very large yeah i can say very large because compared to the to the normal size of microalgae a spirulina have 500 micrometers or 200 to 500 micrometers so easily uh, filtered yeah <coughs> this uh, also time saving yeah you can use membrane or you can use uh, a normal uh, filters and then uh, another harvesting method is uh, sonication yeah sonication this is uh, Normally, just uh, pumping organism continuously into uh, into resonator chambers, and then you, uh, there is acoustic forces. Then the microalgae will yeah will uh, will be extracted. <coughs> and another uh, harvesting method we have centrifugation, precipitation. Yeah, and yeah, that's uh, the the commands of the harvesting. Can use so in the system is really a bit like this for the flocculations. Yeah, if you add uh, more flocculants and then uh, the microalgae will go to the bottom and then uh, the we can do the weathering and then we will have uh, biomass. <clears throat> okay, and now we uh, come to the core for the presentation that uh, for algae biomass to energy. So this is the uh, cultivation process. Yeah, we have sunlight. We have a uh, nutrient and we have a uh, carbon dioxide or carbon sources. Uh, seaweed here meaning that uh, you can also replace the nutrient, nitrogen, phosphor, and kalium instead of using external uh, original nit nitrogen, uh, chemical nitrogen that you can use also from service water. Uh, then uh, you can go to photobioreactor, then extract it. And depend on the uh, processing that you want to use, and uh, you will have uh, bioelectricity, bioethanol, biodiesel, and also bio, bio uh, after or jet fuel. By far, is also possible. Okay. <clears throat> so, how much the oil content actually uh, in the microalgae? In the oil contents of microalgae, uh, if you look at the productivity of uh, microalgae compared to other crops. Uh, we see here the soy is only 0 0.45 uh, cubic meter per hectare of the land. And then for, for Chatrofa, it is uh, 1.6 uh, high compared to other uh, crops. Yeah, It's about 150 uh, cubic meter uh, per, per hectare. So that's uh, the great potential for uh, these microorganisms to generate the uh, oil. <clears throat> this uh, some uh, microalgae oil, yeah, that already identified. For instance, microalgae Vitrococcus brownie, they have uh, 25, 75 percent, and then some chlorella is about 30 percent, and then nanochloropsis about uh, 30 till 68 percent, yeah, and then we have also Pyrocapillum tricornotum until 20. Till 30 uh, percent of oil, yeah, in their biomass. Uh, now, uh, how about the algae to biodiesel? I think once we get the oils uh, from the algae, now we just converted using uh, esterification or trans esterifications, yeah, and then uh, we will have a uh, biodiesel. This uh, example that already done by uh, Ahmad et al. in 2017, yeah, uh, crude algae oil. If you do uh, esterification first, because maybe the acid value is 10 uh, milligram uh, calcium hydroxide per gram, yeah. So it is uh, bigger than two. It means that you have to reduce it. Otherwise, you will have a uh, saponification reactions. And then uh, using esterifications. Uh, it reduced up to 0 0.51, yeah. 
and then it's already enough uh, already enough for uh, tran esterification uh, then for the second uh, esterification step and then you will have a uh, bio biodiesel here that the uh, uh, biodiesel and then glycerols already uh, already obtained yeah uh, component biodiesel, uh, biodiesel component from uh, this microalgae uh, normally uh, mainly composed by uh, palmitic acid, it's about 40%, and then uh, followed by uh, linoleic and linolenic acid, yeah, or C18, uh, about 17% uh, and 18%. I think that's uh, the main component for uh, biodiesel, so that's, uh, uh, that's very high potential for this. Uh, Microalgae. Uh, <coughs> I look at as well here. If you uh, compare the standard, yeah, standard for biodiesel, and then this is the biodiesel that derived from the bio uh, microalgae. Yeah, so from ABC. Yeah, this is some kind of uh, microalgae species. They can be extract uh, the oil and then converted to biodiesel. Yeah. It's here that uh, some properties of the biodiesel are uh, already in the right standard. Yeah, for instance, the zeta number. Yeah, zeta number is uh, uh, in the magnitude of forty. Uh, in the magnitude of forty, and then also uh, seventy. Yeah, in some maybe in the some typical only ampidinium is under the uh, the standard. <coughs> And then uh, other criteria, uh, other, uh, other physical properties of a biodiesel from microalgae is already investigated and already in the range of standard. Yeah, uh, and the standard is normally two and six for kinematic physical city, and uh, the biodiesel is uh, that the octane is already in that range. Yeah, and also the density is also uh, is also in good uh, properties. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, and then for bioactor, yeah, uh, actually the uh, when uh, the research of macroalgae is already started in two thousand, I mean it's becoming booming in two thousand ten. Yeah, uh, some companies in Europe already uh, start to invest uh, to invest uh, some money uh, for this research. For instance, here for KLM, the flight uh, from. Uh, Netherlands, yeah, they invest uh, some uh, money as well to grow the algae for the bio after. And then uh, this is uh, BBC News. They also reported that uh, there there were a first flight of algae fuel jet. Yeah, they can uh, yeah by using uh, by using mix between the conventional after and the bio algae. Uh, <clears throat> They can uh, fly uh, 90, 90 minutes, yeah. So it's also proof that uh, microalgae is potential as well for uh, bio afterwards. <clears throat> and then for bioethanol, because it's con uh, content of a very high carbohydrate, yeah. This is some kind of microalgae, and then carbohydrate. Uh, content in these uh, microorganisms, we have they have a um, range from nine to fifty-four uh, percent. So it's very uh, it's enough uh, uh, to have a bioethanol if they do fermentation of it. And this uh, example uh, proposed by Delatoni, yeah, uh, based on the enzyme or catalyst that they use, uh, and this is the type of the microorganisms they can. Uh, have uh, bioethanol with certain uh, concentrations, so from six till twenty-six percent uh, concentration of ethanol. And then for to have a food grade bioethanol, then you can add uh, for the processing like uh, distillation, yeah, to increase from twenty-six uh, percent till ninety ninety percent. Uh, how about the bioelectricity from algae? Is that possible? Yes, uh, is that possible? Uh, normally, the uh, bioelectricity is generated by using microbial fuel cell. Yeah, in microbial fuel cell, uh, there are two chambers here: anoda, yeah, anoda and cathoda. Yeah, in anoda, normally they uh, we put uh, with water in it. Yeah, 
in wastewater uh, there are uh, there is a uh, reaction yeah or there is uh, some activity of by bacteria yeah uh, <coughs> bacteria will consume uh, the carbon source in uh, that chamber and then generating co2 yeah generating co2 and also some electron uh, is produced the electron will be transferred to external circuit to the uh, cathode uh, cathode uh, chamber yeah through the external external circuit and of course there is uh, <coughs> uh, oxidator yeah to accept the electron here yeah electron here so there is water yeah uh to to accept the electrons yeah to accept the electron here and then uh, there is transfer also here from uh, uh, h plus yeah to this uh, chamber so there is uh, electricity transfer yeah electricity generated uh, because there is a transfer between proton and electron from the uh, anode and cathode yeah if we uh, look at here the important things here that uh in the anode chamber generating co2 we look at the photosynthetics yeah photosynthesis uh, of microorganism co2 is important for uh, carbon sources yeah and then uh, we look at here as well that uh, electron uh, will be uh, accepted by oxygen yeah uh, will be accepted by oxygen it means that if you have uh, more oxygen in the cathode chamber it will uh, accept more electron yeah accept more electron so we will have uh, more generating uh, bioelectricity uh, <clears throat> now if we combine uh, this uh, photosynthetic yeah for instance if we uh, instead of using water or water in the cathode and then we replacing by microalgae here and we remember that microalgae will consume uh, carbon sources as uh, in the photosynthesis yeah and then in the photosynthesis will generating oxygen as well yeah and then uh, this principle can be used uh, for uh, oxidator as well yeah uh, to accept the electron uh, so instead of using a conventional microbial film cell we combine with microalgae yeah. So we call it here as MMFC. MFC is a microbial fuel cell. So we have MMFC means that microalgae microbial uh, fuel cell because combination between uh, microbial uh, activity in the anode chamber and then microalgae in the cathode uh, chambers. Yeah. <clears throat> so we ex we uh, assume that CO2 will be transferred from CO2 uh, from anode chamber to cathode chamber uh, uh, then will be consumed by microalgae to have a photosynthetic uh, reactions yeah and then uh, electron during uh, microbial activity will be generated and then transferred to the uh, cathode chamber and then will be accepted by uh, oxygen as a result of the photosynthesis yeah so that the process uh, will uh, reduce the uh, the the use of platinum uh, as the catalyst as well here <clears throat> uh, you see here that uh, uh, from the our experiment the microalgae that are uh, cultivated in the cathode chamber is can cult well yeah uh, we have eight run or uh, eight variables uh, for this uh, mic microalgae uh, experiment and then for the wastewater or COD chemical or second demand removal is also uh, successfully uh, uh, done here yeah in the anode chamber <clears throat> uh, how much the bioelectricity can be produced from this uh, microalgae uh, this is our uh, experiment for the last uh, line yeah using tapioca with water using microalgae spirulina platensis we can have power density about 14 uh, milliwatt per uh, square meter this comparable with the others uh, other experiment by other researcher for instance here using activated slot yeah the microalgae using uh, chlorella flageris they have a certain 13.5 uh, uh, milliwatt per square meters yeah and then uh, for 
yeah, for others uh, bacterial substrate, for instance, petrochemical wastewater, and then using skenidesmus uh, abundance, they can produce uh, electricity 3.37 uh, milliwatt per square square meter. So our experiment is uh, be comparable to to others. Yeah, of course you can also play with another type of microalgae and also another type of wastewater. Uh, there are a lot of room to play in this uh, experiment. For instance, you can add uh, yeast, yeah, yeast in the anode chamber, yeah, to increase the activity of the bacteria uh, and to help the bacteria give or produce more electron and then uh, can be captured by, by microalgae in the cathode chamber. <coughs> And then some uh, of our uh, paper. And then uh, another uh, application for uh, microalgae in energy is uh, algae can be used for co-substrate for in biogas production. Co-substrate means that uh, it's just additional, yeah, additional for substrate in, uh, in biogas production. So normally biogas is... Uh, is uh, obtained by uh, fermenting uh, waste, yeah, organic waste yeah, from from manure or from the animal waste, yeah, and then uh, by using anaerobic digestion that will uh, produce uh, uh, biogas, yeah, biogas com contain methane and carbon dioxide, and then how about microalgae? Then microalgae here can be used for co-substrate. It means that uh, microalgae just uh, added to the biodigester, yeah, to adjust the CN ratio, yeah, CN ratio of the organic waste, and then you will have uh, better, better biogas. This some uh, experiment that already done. For instance, in this the mono digestion, it means without microalgae, you have a barley straw, yeah, uh, as uh, organic waste, and then uh, they can produce. Uh, 196 uh, by gas, yeah. Oh, but if you add co-digestion as well here, for instance, uh, give 85 percent of uh, by gas, yeah. <clears throat> so that's the importance of uh, using uh, microalgae in uh, by gas production. And then uh, another application, if you look at the. Uh, algae for CO2 capture. Again, we have to consider the photosynthetic reactions. Photosynthetic reaction always uh, uh, run from uh, carbon source into bio biomass. Now, if you look at the industry, yeah, industry, uh, for instance, the coal industry, they produce a lot of uh, flue gas. Now, flue gas is uh, contain normally 10 to 20 percent CO2, yeah, and we remember CO2 in this uh, flue gas is a free source for uh, carbon sources for microalgae, so we can use it as well for uh, carbon sources, yeah, for microalgae. So you look at here, it's uh, this is an industry, and then uh, there is a flue gas, then put it in the photobioreactor, microalgae will consume CO2, yeah. Then uh, the advantage is you will have a microalgae biomass, and also you will have a clean gases that are out from your industry. So that's the two advantages of using uh, this. The experiment that already done uh, using flue gas, you see here the variation of CO two uh, in the in the gases in the mix of uh, gas. You see that uh, CO two. Uh, in, in the biogas can increase the growth rate of the bio bio uh, biomass or of microalgae yeah of course uh, you cannot go uh, higher than maybe 30 or 40 percent so two uh, in the in the fluid gas because it will it will inhibit uh, the growth and make the microalgae uh, die <coughs> uh, we did some experiment as well yeah in the uh, absorbing as uh, flue gas using microalgae you see here that uh, 
uh, the microalgae can absorb uh, flue gas that contain uh, 30% CO2, but uh, more than 30% or more than 50%, the microalgae will start to die. Yeah. <clears throat> But at least uh, it helped the industry to to clean uh, the the flue gas that uh, run to atmosphere. Uh, another application for this uh, microalgae is uh, to upgrade the biogas. Yeah, remember again that photosynthetic microorganism uh, microalgae will absorb uh, CO two only. Yeah, and then how about the, the biogas? Yes, biogas normally contain of uh, thirty percent CO two, yeah, and then sixty to seventy percent uh, CH four or methane. If we increase uh, methane compound in the biogas, and the caloric value will be high, yeah, will be higher. So the the way is how we can reduce the CO two content in the biogas. CO2 content in the biogas can be reduced by absorbing using CO2, uh, using uh, microalgae. Yeah. Uh, this is for uh, instance for the uh, for the setup. So this biogas then uh, running to the photobioreactors for uh, the CO2 and CH4 or methane, and then uh, CO2, and then uh, <coughs> microalgae will be pumped yeah, from uh, the photo from the source yeah, uh, to the photobioreactor and there is contact between uh, biogas and microalgae. A cell will consume CO2 only yeah, and CH4 uh, will be not consumed by the microalgae. Yeah. And then uh, the biogas released from the bioreactor it will have a high content of methane. It means that the caloric value will Will be will be higher, and then again we also have a biomass of microalgae. Uh, this is uh, just a graph uh, to show whether uh, the caloric value or heating value of the uh, biogas will increase by reducing CO two. Yeah, so it's here that CH four in the biogas is increased until seventy. For instance, 70, and then heating value is also increased. So the way how to increase the heating value by reducing CO2 in the biogas. Uh, hydrogen from algae this is also possible, but uh, I will not uh, discuss a bit uh, this uh, slide. But the prop, uh, the principle is uh, algae can convert, yeah, can convert. Uh, Water, yeah, with water until anti uh, to hydrogen, yeah, using uh, photosynthetic, yeah, photosynthetic one and photosynthetic uh, two. But that is possible, and we are not working on this, so I will skip this one. <coughs> uh, okay, and then uh, we talk about already. Uh, the single processes, single application of microalgae. Uh, how about we integrate all the processes? Yeah, for instance, uh, if we have flue gas here, and then uh, flue gas, if the gas consumed by the microalgae in the uh, open pond or in the photobioreactor, and then uh, the photosynthetic reaction will produce oxygen oxygen can be captured again yeah and then supply to the wastewater treatment in the uh, yeah in the industry uh, to be used by the bacteria yeah and then the industry itself normally they also uh, have a wastewater that contain nitrogen and phosphor nitrogen and phosphor can be used for nutrient for microalgae so on the nutrient is written back to the photobioreactors and then using sunlight our photoreactors uh, our microalgae will uh, will grow yeah will grow and then uh, we can harvest the biomass yeah we can harvest the biomass we can extract the biomass use uh, for uh, for their uh, product for example for uh, food for energy yeah and then the residue of this biomass, yeah, of the residue of this biomass can be used for fertilizer, yeah, fertilizer, or even for food, or even for feed uh, 
uh, for our animals yeah and then uh, for oil oh, sorry for oil that already extract from this biomass uh, uh, can be go further uh, for bio refinery and then uh, uh, we have biodiesel then to run the, our our machine so actually uh, this process can be done yeah in uh, in industry uh this simple uh integration process that already done uh, by our groups uh, we did some experiment in <coughs> in palm oil uh, industry yeah palm oil industry they produce wastewater that contain uh this characteristic yeah uh, chemical oxygen demand for palm oil mill effluent or pome uh, uh they have uh, 50000 uh milligram per liter while the uh, biological oxygen demand is about half 25,000 uh, and then they also have a uh, total nitrogen uh, 70, uh, 750 yeah, milligram per liter and phosphor 180 so this uh, the advantage of this wastewater they have uh, this nitrogen and they have this phosphor but in the meantime we also reduce we have to reduce this uh, other uh, chemical characteristic like COD and B, POD. Yeah, so that's the challenge. How we can how we can uh, uh, use RLG to to overcome this uh, wastewater. Uh, palm oil mill effluent wastewater of uh, palm oil industry normally uh, so far conventionally they just put in the four like gin yeah four ponds open pond, open uh, lake like this yeah uh, first for the initial and then after uh, maybe 20 or 30 days then transfer to second pond and then third pond and fourth pond until uh, fourth ponds uh, the coming from the last pond is normally this uh, have value yeah but the COD and BOD value is still higher than uh, requirement so uh, it can be uh, not throw away to the water body. Uh, so, yeah, but then, ma ma yeah. Uh, yeah, because we are running out of time. Uh, hopefully, yeah. maybe you can just uh, wrap up your, your slide, maybe. Okay, uh, yeah, we are really, really running out of time. Sorry about that. Okay, this. sorry, yes, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I think I have two more slides, so this is okay. So normally if uh, just put in the pond, uh, uh, the, because COD is very high, then uh, they will produce uh, methane and CO2 that as a greenhouse effect uh, will will affect yeah, to, to the atmosphere. That How about if we cover this uh, by using this one? For instance, uh, the pond is covered uh, from the top, yeah? And then we'll have a biogas, and then biogas will be uh, transferred to the photobioreactors, and then uh, a photobioreactor consists of microalgae. Microalgae can be harvested, and then you will have a biomass. The biogas uh, can be upgraded by using microalgae itself, then uh, using purification, then will be used for uh, cooking or other electricity purposes. <clears throat> Okay, this is uh, our site uh, works. Yeah, in our project, uh, we successfully install a open pond to absorb the or to use of water, uh, and then uh, finally we'll have uh, we have a biomass for this uh, microalgae. In this time, we use it uh, for uh, feed. Yeah, because from this water, so we cannot use for food uh, consumption. Thank you, Pa Zainul. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, this opportunity. Sorry for running out of time. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you very much uh, to Professor Hadianto for this very wonderful sharing. We would really hope to hear more about your uh, feed and inputs, uh, but we are really running out of time. So maybe if the um, Secretariat, uh, we can share some questions from the audience, from the uh, our FB page, if there's any. Okay, Prof. Uh, I think this is a question from one of our students. Uh, Prof, sorry, if you can just uh, uh, close your PowerPoint slides so that you can see the questions on your, on your screen. Yes. Okay. 
Yeah. So the question is by uh, Miss Karen Lee. He says, "Good morning, Prof. Is it possible to produce bioelectricity from algae and use the uh, produce electricity and supply to residential area in the future?" Yes, uh, that's possible. Yeah, uh, there are two uh, two ways to produce uh, bioelectricity from this microalgae. First, uh, if you have uh, wastewater uh, contains uh, COD and uh, very high cost COD than BOD uh, in the wastewater, uh, as I saw in this uh, last slide, uh, you can combine between uh, producing biogas and also cultivate cultivation of uh, microalgae. Uh, if you have waste water, yeah, with the high content of COD, of course it will produce uh, CH4 and also CO2, and it's called it as a biogas, biogas, and then uh, transfer to the microalgae photobioreactors, yeah, yeah, and then uh, for this biogas uh, can be used for. Uh, for electricity, uh, of course you need uh, some kind of generators to convert from biogas to electricity. And then this can be uh, can be uh, used for uh, humans, uh, uh, electricity as well. And then for the second, uh, the second possibility is by using a micro, micro algae microbial fuel cell that already discussed. Uh, in this case, uh, I think still in, it's not produced in mass production, but it's only in the laboratory scale. But there is opportunity for that. So we we can have combination between fuel cell and also microalgae, of course. We can go for a large scale of this uh, MMFC. Uh, the, uh, the main challenge in this case of our microalgae microbial fuel cell is that the power density that produces is still is still in the scale of milli milliwatt per square meter so we need a large scale of this uh, this unit per se no. but that's possible yeah okay bro uh, the next question is actually i'm asking on behalf of somebody else so i just type in the fb chat that's why my name is over there so yeah. that particular person is asking for the bioesterification process, what is the most desirable fatty acids? Yes. Can, can, can you hear me? Can, can, can you hear me, bro? Bro, can you hear me? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Actually, for the fatty acid, yeah, uh, the total fatty acid that uh, must be uh, used for uh, esterification process, and the total is just must be uh, lower than uh, two, yeah, maybe or uh, maybe some other researchers also said that uh, half or one point five, in order to have uh, uh, better uh, transesterification, not uh, getting uh, saponification uh, processes, but the better uh, fatty acid, essential fatty acid that uh, can be used uh, for this uh, esterification is uh, PUFA, polyunsaturated fatty acid. Yeah. Uh, I think in my slide is also, uh, I, I saw one, uh, one, one uh, observation, yeah, observation of data, uh, how uh, PUFA is very important in, uh, in, in this, uh, in this uh, role, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, bro. There's a, a follow-up question to that actually. Actually, the one asking is the one in in my photo there, which is my wife actually. <laughs> She's also part of the CCA program that we went to Taiwan, but when we, we were not there, she was not there. Okay. So the question is, algae is known as good nutrient supplement. Yes. Is there a way of extracting the essential fatty acids as nutrient supplement? Yes. Uh. Well. Uh, for extractions uh, depend on the uh, on the essential compound that you want to to use yeah that you want to extract for instance, depend on the polarity and that depend on the uh, yeah the, the physical characteristic of the that's uh, that's compound yeah yeah you can use the uh, cheaper one maybe if, uh, in our case in Ficocyanin. Ficocyanin is an essential compound from spirulina uh, that makes uh, that can be used for anti-cancer, also for antioxidant. Uh, 
normally we can use in the industry I'll just use uh, water is possible for this case yeah for this case uh, but you can also use a uh, phosphate solution yeah phosphate solution but it depends on the on the essential essential compound that you want to use uh, you want to extra pass they know or uh, maybe some other also they can use ethanol or methanol yeah ethanol or methanol for uh, this compound or you can use a hexan yeah for instance for uh, extracting so really depend on the uh, essential compound that you want to extract yeah okay uh, maybe we have another question okay uh, we have i think this is one last question here bro this is from dr amirul abu baka staff from civil engineering a, a new staff of utm He's asking, a uh, harmful algae bloom is a serious issue, especially in the tropical climate water body. Uh, to convert this algae biomass into the form of renewable energy is a sustainable idea of resolving this harmful algae bloom issues. So uh, Dr. Amiro is very keen to know about the effectiveness and efficiency of this energy conversion compared to other sources of renewable energy. Please, bro. Yes. Uh... Yes, I do agree that the uh, algae bloom is a very serious problem in the in the aqua, our aquatic system right now, and that's why uh, converting uh, this uh, biomass in uh, our microalgae into other products, uh, oil or also feed and also other uh, product is very uh, one of the alternative. Yeah, I can say it's one of the alternative. It's, it's not the best, but maybe one of the alternative uh, rather than just let the bloom uh, grow. Uh, on top of the water surfaces that will make a problem for uh, aquatic organisms uh, living under uh, under the water. So how about the efficiency? Yes, the efficiency uh, converting uh, this microalgae to energy maybe still in uh, still in under under a research because the main problem in the uh, using uh, microalgae for other product is uh, harvesting. It consists only 10%, maybe uh, even lower, yeah, even lower than 10% of biomass. So if you have one liter, so only 100, uh, 100 grams, uh, 100 milligrams is that uh, content of biomass. Uh, that's uh, the, the challenge, uh, how we can uh, increase the the harvesting process and then for the converting yeah converting uh, from the biomass into energy that's uh, another uh, another point that we have to consider i think once we have the right uh, biomass uh, biomass or even for dry or wet and then converting uh, will be not a uh, problem but the the problem is in the downstream processing itself yeah extracting the biomass itself from the uh, from the solution or from the cultures. <clears throat> yes, but same. Okay, Prof, thank you very much for the answer. I think uh, we have come to the end of the session uh, of your talk and also the Q&A session. So on behalf of the uh, uh, Secretariat and also Yutian, we would like to thank for your presence uh, today. I know you're a very busy man. Yeah, and also to accept our invitation for one hour sharing with our session. So Prof, uh, for the uh, to conclude this session, uh, Allow me to invite our distinguished uh, uh, Dean again, Professor Rafiq, to proceed with his, uh, his uh, sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof Zainul, for chairing and moderating the session and uh, for introducing Prof Hadianto to me. And to our distinguished speaker today, Professor Hadianto, thank you so very much. First, for accepting our invitation and for a great sharing session. You have shared quite a bit. There is a lot of stuff that you shared just now and uh, it will benefit uh, a lot of our viewers uh, we have uh, close to 250 unique viewers live viewers and i'm sure the video recording of this webinar will be watched by thousands others after this so again thank you so much for a great sharing session and to all of you watching utm engineering distinguished lecture series thank you so much for watching do stay tuned because we have many more interesting lectures for you. Until next time. Bye bye for now. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Okay, bye everyone. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you very much.